Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Tales, Outer Tales, Space, Tales, Space, Tales, Space, where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would just like to thank the following tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Data Magnet and Bob the Dragon. Thank you again. And now, on to the story. Masters of War, written by Ogiwan. It was supposed to be a study period, but final exams were last span. With another span to go until the end of the instruction cycle, the cadets, to use the Terran term, were scattered about the room talking and joking in small groups. The pressures to study and succeed were like nothing these young Siraki had ever encountered, so they gladly took advantage of a momentary slack to relax. Even the instructor, a scarred veteran of countless campaigns, was drowsy on the lectern and enjoying a patch of sunlight. One of the cadets, known to be somewhat reckless, stood up. Or Elder Suhu, may I ask a question? The grizzled instructor opened an eye and grumbled, Sreek! War Elder Su, you have fought in many cycles and have earned countless war honors. We all wished we could be like you, but we all know the terrors of combat. How do you overcome your fears? Su hissed in approval of the question and turned his head to look at the cadet with both eyes. You overcome your fears in two ways, sir. First is by facing them and remembering your duty. The second is to speak about them and to listen to others, to expel the fear so that it doesn't gnaw away at your insides. The cadet bobbed his head in acknowledgement. Or Elder Suhu, would you permit me another question? Suhu nodded in response. What was your most fearful experience? Suhu's tail twitched, remembering. He rubbed a piece of yellow metal on one of his claws, what the humans would call a ring. Its face bore a simple insignia, a torch with three stars above it, and a kite shield. Receiving final feedback on my capstone paper, my thesis in human terms. One or two of the chanting groups of cadets quieted at this response. The inquisitive cadet's eyes, membranes nicktated in confusion. Receiving a grade was your most frightening experience, Waralda. So who hissed in anger. Not the receiving, Egling, but the realization of what it meant. He quieted in thought. Cadet, what is it the purpose of this institution? The cadet proudly responded. To provide the future war leaders with the necessary skills and knowledge to lead their war groups. Just so. Now, cadet, once you've moved beyond having a single war group under your command, do you know everything? When you have hundreds, or even thousands, of war groups under your banner, do you have the necessary knowledge and skills to lead them? Several other groups of cadets had fallen silent by now, caught up by the promise of Suhu's history. I have not thought about that, war leader. Where does one go to learn about warfare aside from a battlefield? The humans have thought of that. When it comes to war, it seems the humans have thought of almost everything. This very school was started as a result of what we saw from their fighting in the Cold Trump War five cycles ago. Once this school starts graduating cadets, we'll start another school to teach higher level war leaders the skills and knowledge they need. After that school produces graduates, we'll start up a third for still higher war leaders. One of the cadets hissed in dismay. More school? Just how much school do we need to be a war leader? We just need to know how to fight. So who hissed? Warfare is more than knowing how to handle your weapon. Foodish acting. It is as much an art as a science. Then the humans have mastered both. Hopefully you will realize this after you deliver me a paper on the Terran General Staff from the territory of Prussia. By the start of the next instruction cycle, he cast a punctuating glare at the cadet and snapped, Do not speak out of turn, especially not with ignorant and lazy questions. 
The room was silent at this point, anticipating the important outcome of Suhu's anger. After a moment spent trying to calm down and return his neck rule back to place, he continued. Yes, continual education and development of war leaders is one of the many things the humans do that we seek to emulate. Their results are undeniable. For the last 10,000 cycles, galactic politics have been determined by the sides taken by great military powers. Of the four, one must have two on their side and bribe the third to stay neutral. No race has ever withstood three of them at once, especially not any race new to the galactic scene. All so it was. And then the humans not only withstood the Kilra, Ulro, and Maclari at the same time, but they also annihilated the forces sent against them. From what I saw, even if the Slark had joined alongside three other military powers, the humans still would have won handily. Quite a few tales twitched at the fear of this blunt admission of the mighty humans. The still standing inquisitive cadet asked, but how, war leader? Are the humans so strong? I don't recall them being particularly physically intimidating. Instructor Jackson is smaller than me and weaker than me. So who answered? Humans are tougher than you think. While we can regenerate lost limbs, humans can heal from practically anything that doesn't kill them outright. But their physical characteristics aren't their secret. It's their mental and cultural characteristics. Remember that humans are adaptable and competitive. Their competitive nature gives them a long history of conflict to draw on, and their adaptability means that they can go anywhere, do anything, and learn quickly, and change behavior rapidly as a result. A human military unit will be unpredictable, capitalize on your weakness, and always take an inordinate amount of time and effort to destroy. War Elder, you speak of the humans like they are some kind of military monster in the night. Humans aren't monsters in the night. They're worse. They're real. If you go up against the Kilra, you know they're going to try and attack from ambush. Humans don't have a specific way of fighting. Their changing talents have evolved with them. Human recorded history goes back about 6,000 of their cycles... Of those, only 200 cycles were entirely free of conflict. For the rest, someone, somewhere, was fighting. An uncomfortable stir ran through the credence. Now, while almost all other races have even longer recorded history, none have had so much conflict. What is worse, the humans have studied their past wars, and they have learned from them. Not only that, but they have people whose sole purpose is to try and learn more lessons from the past. Terran war leaders have studied these lessons, and they provide a foundation that all sorts of concepts of war fighting can rest on. Cadet, summarize the Battle of Halon's Reach in the Coltrum War. Moralda, the Battle of Halon's Reach was an engagement between the Balro war host of the Almog and the Terran Third Expeditionary Corps of General Jackson. It occurred on a planet of Halon's Reach and was an overwhelming Terran victory. Zahu nodded in acknowledgement. Quite so. I was attached to Jackson's headquarters as an observer, and I have to admit that I was also watching for personal reasons, he said, gesturing at the small and lighter colored arm. I lost my arm to the Alamog and wanted to see a bit of misfortune come his way. I couldn't see how the humans could win, since they were both physically smaller and outnumbered by the Bulro. But I was hoping nonetheless. An expression flickered across his face then, and his voice changed with a grim awe. The initial Bulro charge was stopped so thoroughly that it was as if it hit a wall and then mobile units maneuvered to strike at its flanks of the Balro warhost. An orbital drop in near the rear sealed the Balro's face. Nine in ten of the Balro took to the field that day were lost. Nine in ten. After the battle was over, I congratulated Jackson on his victory, and he seemed disappointed. I asked him what was the matter. 
and his response was, We didn't get all of them. I told him that it was impossible to totally destroy an enemy forces of any substantial size. He then told me of multiple instances in human history where such a thing happened. He explained what his logic and choosing his tactics were based on, and ended with, I was just looking for my own cane. So who stared intently into the eyes of the cadets? The humans study their war leaders. They learn about them what they did and why they did it, and take their lessons from their victories and defeats. They write about them and argue endlessly about them. Names like Alexander, Napoleon, Mainstein, Whitehaven, Mahan, Klautswitz, Hart, Adolphus, Turin, and countless others are thrown about to support this argument or that. Early on, given how frequently and passionately these names were spoken, I was half convinced that a religion of the human warrior class was filled with bloody-handed demigods of slaughter in a pantheon of war and death. I'm still not totally convinced that this isn't the case. He raised his adorned hand, waving it for all to see. I was sent to the war college in Penn's woodlands on Earth to learn the human outlook on war. I took classes and studied alongside other human high-ranking war leaders. I cannot tell you how many books I read, how much time I spent studying and writing and debating. What I learned, J.H.B. Like the Pulro, we have a long tradition of studying how to fight. The humans do that as well, but they also study how to make war. They know how to do it as efficiently and effectively as possible, and they apply that knowledge to the frightening effect. Sue so, gestured again. My capstone paper, my thesis, was on the conquest of Nanzuna the Great. Even before it was completed, the war leader conclave was issuing early chapters as required reading for other war leaders. It has been described as a foundational book of the Sulaki military history. Some of my conclusions are basic tenets of our military theory. What was the feedback from my thesis committee? So gaze swept the room. His neck full opened with agitation and fear. Adequate! Some of the humans have called me the Slark Hans Delbruck, with Delbruck being regarded as the father of modern Terran military history. I am assured a place in the Hall of Elders to commemorate my writing and teaching. Yet, my analysis, my understanding of military theory, my grasp of warfare, is nothing special to the humans. The war elder speared the inquisitive cadet with a look. You ask me what my most fearful experience was. Learning that next to humans, our knowledge of warfare was like holding a candle next to a sun. Realizing that only a fluke of diplomacy prevented our empire from being shattered like the Kilra Empire. Knowing that the ferocity of the Balro, or the speed of the Kilra, or the techno-wizardry of the Maklari cannot contest the fact that humans have a god of war who whispers the secrets of victory into their ear. Understanding that, the galaxy is changed forever now that the humans have shown their claws. So who again gazed out of the cadets in the room, many of whom had now necrals partially raised in fear as well. Some of you may make it to higher levels of command, or even into our government. If you do, remember this. Always ensure the humans are our allies, for they are the masters of war, and the galaxy trembles at their march. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one. And until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.